everybody, and welcome to Gen Friends. I'm your host, Sherry Hudson Passy from Carolina Girl Genealogy. We have got a great panel. We've got Melissa Barker. Hi, Melissa. She is our archive lady sitting in the archives. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. So good to have you here. And of course, we've got Dan Earl, our family history guy. Hey, Dan. Hello. And Dan brought along a friend tonight, a special guest. And so I thought I would let Dan introduce him. Thank you. So, so we, uh, we have with us today uh, a professional genealogist from Mexico, Nefi Arenas Salazar. Um, and uh, you are from, if I'm remembering right, just, just southwest of Mexico City. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm from Mexico City. I'm excited to be here. Right now I live an hour west from Mexico City wow. in, a, in a different city across the mountains. But yeah. Awesome. Exactly. Well, thank, thanks, Dan. And thank you yeah. for being here. Guess what we're talking about? <laughs> we're talking yeah. about yeah. Mexican gene genealogy. And, you know, none of us on the panel have done any Mexican genealogy. So I'm really excited to hear if there's, you know, record groups or, you know, special methodologies or whatever, but I will let you get started and then we will just throw our questions at you. <laughs> so yeah, perfect. yeah. Yeah. So I, actually I've been watching a few videos from, uh, from, from Gen Friends mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know that you've had a, a, a few uh, guests from uh, who, who do genealogy in other parts of the world. And for people who are familiar with genealogy research in the U.S., and, other, and a little bit of other places, I would say very generally that research in Mexico is kind of similar to doing research in some European countries. Mm, okay. Uh, the, the, the two main record types that, you, that we have are first, the, the civil registration records, you know, many European countries in the, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, in the 19th century, they started doing uh, civil registration by their governments. Uh, we started doing the same around 1860. Different places in Mexico started doing it a little bit after that, depending on the on the state and on the municipality. But yeah, so the it was a it was and it is a government office that records births, marriages, deaths, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And before that, and uh, when when you get past 1860, uh, which is when it started, we use mainly Catholic records. Um, mm -hmm. In some countries, sometimes you have to figure out what religion your ancestors belong to, what church they attended, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. In Mexico, it's very simple. Before <laughs> 1858, there was no freedom of religion. The Catholic Church was the official church. It was the Church of State. So pretty much everyone, everybody was Catholic. You just need to figure out where they lived and uh, find the parish records, and wow. they are there. Are they, are they pretty open, or...? Um, yes. Yeah, and available. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah, most of it is online in Family Search. Oh, fabulous! Most, oh, that's good. Most, most civil registration records are indexed and online. There are a few exceptions. Some of them are uh, uh, digitized, but not indexed yet. They are in process, but most of them are indexed. Mm -hmm. As far as Catholic records, most of them, the great majority of them, are on Family Search. A lot of them are indexed. Many times you need to uh, go to the catalog and find out if they are indexed or not, and then mm -hmm. browse images. Uh, for, for my own research, I have browsed thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of images, but they are there. I mean, I can- there. Just, Well, that's I, when you, you know, throw a plug out to anybody that speaks you know, Spanish and can read these records, <laughs> get in their mm -hmm. indexing, right? <laughs> if they can, yeah, <laughs> if you can read Spanish, and if you can read the script from those times, mm -hmm. yeah. you can read them from your home. You can you can just open your computer, yeah. uh, go go to Family Search or or several other uh, genealogy services, and find the records. That's great. That's great. Is there a, a time period where there was massive record loss, like during oh. the war or something, or are things pretty? You know, because we've got we've got um, places in the United States. And, and other countries where wars yeah. happened and then, you know, courthouses get burned and, you know, records get destroyed. So is there a time period like that for Mexico? Yes, it depends. It's not very common, but yes. Actually, that, that's a misconception that a lot of people who are familiar with Mexican history have. Most, a, a lot of people uh, think that 
uh, in in during the Mexican Revolution, all of the church records were were burned or something. Ah. It 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 happened in in a few towns. Yeah. But it's not the it, it's not the majority. It's not something common. Oh. Yeah. So we had a we had a civil war, which is what we call the Mexican Revolution, mm -hmm. which started in 1910, and all, uh, and all, a few rec a few places, a few towns, especially in northern Mexico, uh, suffered mm -hmm. uh, record loss, record burning. But yeah, I mean, it's not it's not something very prevalent, let's say. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's good because you know that's really hard when you're researching and find out all the records burned from the yeah. place that you need, right? Exactly. Yeah, there's actually a town here in central Mexico which is called Nopala in the state of Hidalgo, which is where I have some ancestors, and the records there were burned not in the Mexican Revolution, but actually during the French intervention intervention of Mexico when we were invaded by the French. Uh, so around those times in the 1860s. Um, the records uh, are, are lost. Uh, mm. Before that, both uh, civil records, and, uh, well, a few civil records that already existed and Catholic records. So for, for that part of my family, it's, it, it's been a little bit difficult. I've had to use a lot of DNA evidence and mm -hmm. uh, indirect evidence from, from the few records that, that still exist. But um, yeah, it's, I, I've been able to, to bridge that gap in the records. Especially because, well, there's something here that that I've been wanting to tell you. I know a, a lot of you are gonna get jealous about it. <laughs> Mexican records are just great; are just so full of information. Uh, birth certificates, 95, 99 percent of the time, mention grandparents. Uh, mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it makes jealous. me jealous. <laughs> my birth certificate mentions grand my, my grandparents, and then. Uh, when you get back to the to the early 20th century, late 19th century, when records were handwritten, they mm -hmm. not only mentioned grandparents, they also mentioned their ages and maybe their occupations, wow. and addresses, hey. and all, all kinds of information. There are a few places where marriage records also might mention grandparents. That's not common. But in this town where, where um some of the records were lost, I've been able to find uh, a few examples. Wow. So, so we don't mm. have a record for like 70 years. There's like a 70 year gap, mm -hmm. but a, a lot of times you can bridge that because records mention grandparents. And mm. if, you, if, if they timed it right, you can find grandparents who are also found in older records. Wow, so. that's amazing yeah. and so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and, and also baptism records in some places in Mexico, like in the western part of Mexico, the northern part, uh, depends on the bishopric. They, they might also mention uh, grandparents started in, in 1800. Hmm. So. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Does anybody got a question? I do. Does, um, does Mexico have census records like the United States? Did they take a census? Yes. Yes, it's very similar to the US. Um, However, right now, only the 1930 census is available for researchers. Wow. Yeah, whereas in the U.S. you have like the mm -hmm. 1920 and mm -hmm. the, well, mm -hmm. all of them. Right now, we only have the, the 1930 and it's missing a few states and it's missing all of Mexico City. Oh, gosh. Oh. Yeah. Is there a reason that that's the only one that's available? Why, why aren't others available? I honestly don't know. I've been trying to get an answer for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've read uh, a few guides on Mexican research and I've asked a few people. Um, some, some of them even say like, we think the records are in this government <laughs> office, but they don't let us see them. Or, I gotcha. Or, you know. It's probably some kind of government red tape, huh? They won't, they won't. Yeah, yeah. It's been a, a, a little bit difficult. I, there, there's a place in Mexico City where, where I found a few sources that say the, the census records are there, but it, it hasn't been opened for, for family search or ancestry yet. It mm -hmm. would be great if it had. Oh, yeah. That would be Other great. than those census records, there are also municipal record, municipal census records. Oh. Those are a little bit harder to access. They are usually not uh, digitized or microfilmed. Usually have to go to the usually to go to the municipal archive to, to be able to see them, and there are also church uh, census records. Hmm. 
Uh, those vary widely by by the town. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the priest in, in each church would uh, take a census of all the people. Well, all the everybody was Catholic, so it was all the people uh, <laughs> who who did communion, and mm -hmm. uh, they, they would record their ages, their their families, sometimes their addresses, sometimes occupations, uh, and list if they had uh, well if they were fulfilling their obligations to the church. Right. And also in the late uh, 1700s, around, it depends on the town, around 1791, 1792, uh, the, the colonial government decided to take a, a, a census, uh, which is, well, that one is also in family search, but it's a little bit access to, a, mm. a little bit harder to access. It, it's a little bit tricky, but it exists, exists for a few towns. And it was a military uh, census. However, it contains information from all of the families. It, oh, wow. it says like the head of the household, mm -hmm. the spouse, the children, their ages, and whether or not they were fit for military service, mm -hmm. their height, and oh. if they had any any physical impediment mm -hmm. for military service and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, I mean, Very good. Parents, it, you need to to see if the town where you're res researching has it. But when when it does, it's it's a great resource to have. Do, um, do land records come into play in Mexico? Um, or were people landowners? I mean, other than the, the rich, I mean, because, you know, here we can trace families through the land. And so I wondered if it was the same there. Yes, yes. They are a little bit tricky to access, especially the very recent uh, land records. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Mexico City, it's almost impossible to access them. You need to like, a, like an order from the judge. And <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> However, the ones from the 1600s, 1700s that are in the National Archives are accessible. A few of them are actually in family search and not, not oh, many good. people know that. And um, yeah, I've, I've been able to do a lot of research in them. Uh, of course, there nothing is indexed. Uh, well, <laughs> kind of, there's like a, there are some summaries of, of what records contain. They're not very accurate, but, um, but yeah, they, they exist. There are land titles. Um, there's also land litigation. Um, that, that, those are the ones that I have uh, done research in the most. Uh, we, we, in, the, in the 1700s, there were people who were disputing land borders mm -hmm. and, and there were also like the indigenous communities um, suing a Spaniard who was trespassing on their land or vice versa. Okay. And, and, and so they, they would go before the royal audience in Mexico City and present their copies of their land records and they would make copies of them for, for oh, that record. Oh, great. So that was, uh, yeah, you want, you want a dispute yeah. then, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Because they would go back and explain, hey, so I inherited this land from this person who was my ancestor. Yeah. And then they got it from a land grant like a hundred years ago or, or they bought it from this person and you can, you can get the, you, you can, can reconstruct that. a lot of, Sure. Family relationships when in, in, in times when church records might not be very, very complete for that town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can bridge uh, many gaps for that hmm. uh, using those land records. That sounds, yeah. mm -hmm. that sounds fun. Dan, did you have a question? I thought I saw you. I, I do. So um, here in the here in the States, we have um, in, in terms of surname patterns, it's the very typical pattern is that you just inherit the surname of your of your father or the perceived father. Um, Mexican surnames can be a little bit more complex. So can you talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, surnames in Mexico and, and how those sort of patterns work? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, if you look at my name right now, I don't know if if, mm -hmm. if you can see it, my name is Nefi Arenas. That's my first surname. And then Salazar, that's my second surname. Arenas is my father's surname. And Salazar is my mother's surname. So mm. uh, all, all of us in Mexico, we have two surnames, uh, paternal first and then maternal second. Mm -hmm. Also, another thing is that um, when, when women get married, they never change their name. There's no such thing as married name and maiden name. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we, sometimes we don't understand why people in the U.S. <laughs> or in other places do it. Well, you but, know, uh, for genealogy purposes, boy, I wish that we had the uh, same practice here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, for, so, for modern, I'm sorry, go, go, go. I was gonna say, so for a, a woman then, would it be the same style then? Uh, her first surname would be her father's her father. surname and the second would be her mother's. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah. then she doesn't take, so she doesn't take the, the name of her husband at all. So they've got yeah. two, mm -hmm. two different last names. And then the child then gets the name of the father and the surname of the exactly. mother. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Well, that makes and it I'm, easier to trace. Yeah. I mean. Another it, thing to be jealous about. <laughs> yeah. so, so you have that. And also not only that, but marriages, most of the time mention parents or, mm -hmm. and, and also birth and baptism records mention parents and sometimes grandparents. So yeah, yeah there's. <laughs> It, it's pretty straightforward so yeah that, that's that's how it is for modern uh, names let's say mm -hmm. uh, the two name the, the two surname system uh, was adopted around like it depends on the place it was adopted first in spain and then mm -hmm. uh, we started using it like in the early uh, in the early 20th century late uh, 19th century okay before that people in, in records usually have only one surname the, the paternal surname However, in the 1700s, 1600s, things with names start getting a little bit complicated, uh, especially like people who from nobility or who had a lot of money would have very, very long names. Uh, yeah, I've seen, I've yeah. seen people show examples of these yeah. long names and records. Yeah, like they would combine surnames from like their, 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 their most recent four generations. <laughs> wow. like, like taking the ones that had like, had like most, more nobility or, or more uh, renown yes. or something. Oh, yeah. And they also have like very long baptism names. Like somebody would be, I don't know, like Juan Perez you know, in, in mm -hmm. everyday life. But in mm -hmm. their baptism record, they would be Juan Jose de Paula del Sagrado Corazón. <laughs> so, uh, like like a, a, a few religious names. Uh -huh. and some people would actually use those names in, in real life. Oh, gosh. Like my my great-great-grandfather, his, his name was Porfirio Samudio. But in his baptism, or his full name would, would uh -huh. have been... Um, Jose Porfirio Juan Nepomuceno Samudio y Hernández del Quintanar. You know? Yeah, wow. Uh, That's a lot to name, sign. <laughs> and then the two last names. And then there were compound last names. Uh, oh, like gosh. a last name would, wouldn't be like only one word, but mm -hmm. it would be like, like, I don't know, like, let me make an example in English, like Robert Johnson, but it's not, it's not only Johnson. Johnson from London, like something ah, like that. Ah, okay, you okay. Know? So, yeah. in, for instance, <laughs> my, my paternal last name, Arenas, in the in the 1700s, it used to be Merino de Arenas. Uh -huh. Like Arenas okay. was a, pl it's a place in, mm -hmm. in Spain, and then Merino was the other part of the, of the surname. Yeah. Well, I think that's started. great, yeah. yeah, it's great too, because it gives you a, a, a clue as to where the family was from. And so, well, mm -hmm. maybe. Kind of. <laughs> I mean, the, maybe it was a clue, but from medieval times, mm, or, I get or, you. Okay. Yeah, those surnames were originated like before okay. church records started. So, so, and then they could have been living in another place for a few, for a couple hundred years. Ah, before. okay. So maybe not so much a clue. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it, it it is. Sometimes it's not. It's not not very reliable without other evidence. It's what are that? Something that you you find out that it happened to be that way after the fact you know mm, okay is that naming pattern um uh used across latin america and of course um i spoke to you before we started recording about honduras um i have a stepmother in law who is from honduras um and so is that naming pattern across latin america the same or are there different variations yes there are a few exceptions for instance argentina for instance um uh, argentina uh a lot of people in Argentina don't use it, but in most countries it is. Mm, okay. It's something standard that started in Spain and was imported into all the Latin American countries. Well, let me ask you this question too, because you know, in America, we have our traditional naming patterns, but over the centuries, people have taken it upon themselves to change it. And so um, <laughs> in Mexico, has anyone like kind of uh, gone against the grain 
and and done something some things differently yeah yeah in in, in the last few years uh, the law changed so wow. that uh, when you register a child it, it's not mandatory to have uh, the two surnames or oh. the order now you can switch around you can have the the mother surname first or oh or, uh, yeah. well that's gonna okay. get confusing yeah it is <laughs> future generations yeah. that's gonna get so confusing yeah, they yeah. just don't yeah, think about the genealogists when they do these things do they? <laughs> yeah I, I actually i haven't met anybody who who has uh, done that change i haven't met any child <laughs> with, the, with a new rule who has applied those new rules but um yeah i guess uh, but it's available so it, 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 yeah. it's gonna yeah, happen it's available yeah. Now. Yeah, yeah somebody will do it somebody will do it well, I was going to ask you about the archives. What kind of, because, you know, that's Melissa. Oh, my question. Okay, go right ahead, <laughs> Melissa. Go right ahead. <laughs> well, I'm an archivist and I work in a county archives here in Tennessee. And so, um, you know, I always tell students of genealogy that, you know, there's, in the, in the grand scheme of things, there's a very small amount of records that are online. The rest of them are in archives. Uh, is that the same for Mexico? Do you have really great archives that you can go and see the documents and they're not for the most part all online it depends, <laughs> it depends on the place. <laughs> for mexico a lot of it is in family search as i said mm. um like like civil records and church records the, the backbone of our research there are also some more niche records that are also on family search like inquisition records uh, mm. some land records some other yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of on, on family search. It's just amazing. It's, mm -hmm. The Mexican collections are one, some of the, if not the largest one that, that family search has. But um, as far of, as as far as archives, we have the the National Archive in Mexico City. Um, actually, I I, I was there. Um, I, I, it wasn't this week. It was last week. Finally, I'm jealous. After, I'm jealous. After, Our archives aren't yeah. open yet. <laughs> Yeah, after a, after a few months of, of not being able to go because of this, <laughs> this virus that shall not be named, um, <laughs> I was finally finally able to go there again. Oh. Um, yeah, so the, the, the National Archives have a lot of records from all over the country, started in the 1500s. Wow. Um, records from the, the Spanish administration of Mexico City, especially records from the royal audience and the vice royalty. Then we have state archives, and mm -hmm. in some states they can, they can they, there can be several state archives. There can be one general state archive that has the, the documents for um, like the government of the state, the historical documents of, about the, mm -hmm. the government. And then there might be like a judicial power arch, archive that has documents about criminal cases and evil, even notarial archives. Mm -hmm. Well, and some other, some other states have notarial archives that are only for wills and, and, and uh, records of sale of, of lands and stuff like that. And then on the next level, it's like three levels, the national, state, and then the, munici the municipality, there are municipal archives. Mm -hmm. Municipal archives are usually the hardest ones to access. Um, there are new laws that require ar archives to organize the documents and mm. and apply some best practices, but right now it's still a little bit difficult to to access them. Um, yeah. Some of them are, are not uh, indexed or cataloged. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in little towns, like the, polit the local mm -hmm. politicians, are a little bit um, like we have the same thing here. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I can imagine. of course. Yeah. I, I would say it's just a little bit more wild in, in Mexico right now, but it's getting better. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is getting digitized. I've seen a few municipal archives, not in towns that I usually do research in. <laughs> of course. Of course. But, um, they, they have digitized most of it and their website is just amazing and it works perfectly. And other places you call and you never get a, an appointment. And, but yeah, it, it's, it's getting better everywhere. How, um, you know, in the United States and a lot of places in Europe, genealogy, finding, trying to find your family has just exploded the interest. Is it that way in Mexico or are, you st yes. are people still not quite into it yet? Right now, there's a genealogy boom in Mexico. There are a lot of people starting, are, are starting to work as genealogists. A lot of people are getting interest in genealogy, especially because there's a law well, there are laws in Spain and in Portugal that say that if you, if you can prove that you descend 
from Sephardic Jews mm -hmm. who were either expelled from those countries in the 1400s or uh, forced to convert into Catholicism. If you can prove the, the genealogy line to them, mm -hmm. uh, you can claim a Spanish or Portuguese citizenship. Oh, so, okay. yeah, that's what, that's what most people are doing right I now. A, a lot of people okay. are getting interested in that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's kind, of, it's kind of like American Indians here, if you can prove, mm -hmm. yeah, you can be part of that heritage, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, the difference is that, I guess, with, with uh, Native Americans, you need to, like, have certain percentage of your, yeah. your, of, mm -hmm. of your ancestry thing, right? And it's usually, like, recent ancestry, mm -hmm. whereas you were talking about ancestors who arrived in the conquest of Mexico, like, oh, yeah. uh, 500 years ago, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, they do they use DNA to do that to prove that or records? Usually not. Usually, yeah. usually those governments don't. Well, I mean, it's a, it's it's a, it's a little bit tricky. They usually don't accept DNA evidence. Mm. And, and I get a lot of clients who come to me saying, telling me, "Hey, look, I'm two percent Jewish. Can I apply for this?" And I'm like, <laughs> "No, I need to." <laughs> documents that's really interesting that's really interesting yeah. mm -hmm. and, it and, is well go, go, going back to the original question about um uh, about interest in in mm -hmm. genealogy in mexico uh, before like in the in the 1800s uh, in the 20th century there wasn't a lot of it i mean there was there, there, there were geneal genealogical societies, let's say, but it was usually the rich and mm -hmm. everything was about nobility. Everything mm -hmm. was about mm -hmm. proving that you descended from, from a knight, from, from this right. knightly order or, yep. or, or from somebody from, with a noble title or claiming yeah. nobility titles and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, nowadays, especially with family search and the efforts to digitize and bring the records to 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 be avail available to the people it's it, it's been like more democratized mm. um yeah like when, when i buy books written in the 20th century about genealogy is usually about nobility everything is mm. about nobility and origins in spain it was very eurocentric mm -hmm. and and yeah you know but now it's a little bit more uh, varied more, a lot well for starters, a lot of people are looking for their uh, crypto Jewish ancestors, yeah. Yeah. and also a lot of people are starting to research their indigenous ancestors. Ah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is a little bit tricky, but it, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's possible. I, I really like doing it. If, Dan, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? I thought I was interrupting you. Okay, I was going to say if somebody was brand new and say they just they've not done anything. Where where would you suggest somebody get you know start? Where would they get some knowledge on where to begin? Where where would you send somebody who's brand new wanting to research Mexican ancestry? Okay, um, if they lived in in Salt Lake, I would send them to the and, and if 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 this if the uh, if the family history library was open, I I would send them there. I have a I know a few people who work there, and they are great teachers mm -hmm. uh, they also have classes online they, they mm -hmm. broadcast them uh, uh, sometimes on, on facebook and other mm -hmm. platforms and they talk about basic uh, steps for mexican genealogy mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that's what i would tell them i would also tell them to like if they want to like know the first steps of what they can actually do like uh, i would tell them to gather documents about themselves mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. about their immediate family members gather information, gather family histories, and then go to family search or ancestry. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't wanna give like a preference to one or the other. I, I use both, but when you start from scratch, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the search algorithm for, uh, from ancestry for Mexican civil registration records is just great. It's amazing. I mean, you can start getting record after record after record and and then after that, when you when you get to to church records, you kind of have to switch to family search because 
uh, when you when you get to that point, it's a little bit easier to do it on Family Search. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would tell them to open an account on Family Search and Ancestry. Start looking for hints. Start mm -hmm. looking for indexed records, mm -hmm. uh, which in the first few generations is going to be really easy. Mm -hmm. And start uh, trying to read the records, uh, trying to to understand how they work, trying to get familiar with them, and then like yeah, that's yeah, that's it, that's, it, that's it, great. It, it will, it will, their tree will start growing. <laughs> now you you've talked about all these amazing records that are on Family Search. So you know a lot of times we tell people here that you know there's only so much online, and you've got to get out into the community. So yes. is it the same with Mexico, or do you think they put so much um, online that you know they really do have a lot of things, and maybe I mean, I know a lot of people would probably like to take that trip, you know, to, mm -hmm. to Mexico and go I mean, do some, or if you live in Mexico, um, do you still need to get that boots on the ground uh, and, and go to the locations and to find more records? You will get to a point where, where you will need to do it. I mean, it, when, when you research the, the basic backbones of your tree, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be able to get very far back using only what, what is online. But if, if you want to get a little bit more, uh, if you want to learn who they were, more details uh, about their life, yeah, you, you, you probably are going to have to to look for other sources that are not necessarily online. And also, um, once you get to a certain point, um, the, the, the church records might not be so great for those early years. So you're going to have to find uh, some notarial records, some wills and testaments. And... Um, those sometimes are online, sometimes they are not. Sometimes there's an online index, but you have to contact the archive or go to the archive to get the actual images. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I do a lot of work in Northern Mexico in the state of Nuevo Leon, and that's exactly what happens there. Um, you have a lot of great uh, church records, but then when you get to the, to the earliest generations of the, 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 the first settlers of that area, you need to find uh, their, their testaments uh, mm. you know, mm -hmm. to find where they were from be before arriving there or to find some oh, yeah. to find who their parents were because you won't find find it in in the records that are digitized so you know what i love and i love that genealogy is genealogy it really doesn't matter where you're researching it's a, it's really the same methodology isn't it it's the same methodology you just need to learn about different record groups and what, exactly. what's available in that place. Another record group I wanted to ask you about real quick before we before we go are newspapers. I love mm. newspaper research. So is that something that happens very often in, in uh, Mexican research? Are there uh, newspaper resources for people to go to? Yeah, yeah, I do it very often when when, when I get clients who, who not only want to link to certain ancestor or whatever, when they actually want to know who their ancestors were, yeah, I, I do a lot of work on newspapers. Right, good. Um, there are a few Mexican newspapers in archives in the U.S., especially the, the Library of Congress. Ah, okay. Um, there are also, well, what, what, what they have, a lot of what they, the newspapers that they have are um, newspapers from the southern United States. Uh, written in Spanish, and they have a lot of news from Mexico. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, in, in one of them, I actually found a story about uh, one of my ancestors' brothers who was in a duel with somebody <laughs> else for, for, for a girl. <laughs> uh, they, 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 they shot at, at each other, uh, <laughs> like in the Wild West, for, for a girl. <laughs> and also, well, and, and going back to newspapers, um. There's also a very big uh, newspaper archive in Mexico City. It's called the Hemeroteca Nacional, the National Hemeroteca. I don't know if that word exists in, in English. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much the, the National Newspaper Archive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the newspapers that are digitized. Um, a, 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 so there, there are a lot, a lot who are, that, that are not, but uh, some of them are digitized. So yeah, that, that's a great resource for that. But um. Well, if you um, if you would allow me to introduce a topic that I think is sure, kind of... absolutely. I was just going to ask you what have we not spoken yeah. that you want to uh, yeah. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah, because there, there, there's something that that it's a little bit touchy, but I think it's very important uh, to understand Mexican genealogy, and you okay. need to understand 
who the Mexican people are or where do we come from? Mm -hmm. Because when, when, when I've been in the U.S., sometimes I get comments like the Mexican race, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, or somebody doesn't look Mexican or, or something mm -hmm. like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what people need to understand is that there's no such thing as a Mexican race and somebody from Mexico can look uh, in all shades and colors. Mm -hmm. um, if the, the origins of our ancestry are usually three, like the, the indigenous peoples, the civilizations that were in the, in the Americas, in Mesoamerica, like the, like the Mexicas or Aztecs, Mayans, and mm -hmm. so forth. And then the Spaniards that mm -hmm. uh, uh, arrived up in the conquest in 1521 and after that as, as settlers. And then uh, slaves brought from Africa. Well, and then uh, inside the Spaniards, you also have people with Jewish ancestry mm -hmm. who were passing as Catholics and trying to come to the new world. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so m uh, m all, most of us are a combination of all of that. Uh, I, I like the, the, um, the example that, uh, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. I like the example that Dan was uh, speaking about from the, the, the teacher from uh, the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, because yeah, that, that's a great example. Mm. In, in Mexico, it would be like 50% uh, European, 50% indigenous, or like a little bit less of, of those and like four or 5% uh, African. Uh -huh. uh, that would be like an, an average uh, Mexican. And um, I, I, I like to, to, to I, I, I don't know, it's like in, in, in the culture in the US, and this is an overgeneralization, I know it's not like this, but historically, it's, it is my impression that it's been like, like on one side, uh, European or white, and on the other side, uh, black or other races. And you either belong to one or the other. But in Mexico, I like to, uh, to say that, well, I, I don't like to say it. It's, it. The truth is that you don't belong to one or the other. It's more like I belong this much to one and this much to this and this much to this. You know, it's a, it's a melting pot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's okay. great. Yeah. I love that. I love that. All righty. Was there anything else that you can think of that you would like for people to know? And does anybody have a question that we didn't, that you wanted to ask, but didn't get to so far? I've really enjoyed this because like I said, yeah, you, um, you find that we're, we're so much alike, you know, no mm. matter where we're from and, so, and people want to know who their ancestors are, no matter where, they're from and and the methodology like we said is is the same it, it's you know you find your home sources and then you move out from mm -hmm. there you know go and look and see what's online and then you you look at everything online you exhaust that and then you start branching out locally and so it's it's the same everywhere we just need to learn um the different record sets and i know people get stuck and they'll say i've never done this kind of genealogy before i've never done this well if you've done any genealogy, you've done this kind of genealogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just need yeah. to learn the records, and we can exactly. learn. We can learn techniques. We can learn um, how other people research, no matter what country they're researching in. We've always got something that we can learn from other people as they talk about their research. So, exactly. and, and I completely agree. Yeah. I mean, there are things that translate yeah. everywhere. Sometimes I, I, I've gone to conferences or I've watched uh, uh, presentations mm -hmm. uh, from people who do research in, in other countries mm -hmm. and there's always something that I can apply. Oh, yeah. 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 Except, I, I, guess, I guess the difference is that we in Mexico with the records that we have and the level of availability, we're just spoiled. Oh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Mentioning grandparents. That is just <laughs> not fair. That is just yeah. not fair. But yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and then when you get back to the 1600s, 1500s, you find inquisition records, mm. uh, either for people who were accused by the inquisition and they would yeah. uh, like, in, uh, they would research their genealogy. They, they would have a section of the record about this person's genealogy. And oh my God. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and then people on the other hand, who were not accused by the inquisition, but they wanted a job for the inquisition or they wanted to marry somebody who was working yeah. for the inquisition 
they would also research their ancestry. Oh and, my gosh, and, and provide like information. Four generations and then people who wanted to, 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 to fulfill government jobs. They wow. Would do wow. the research and send it to the, to the king and say, hey, my ancestors were in the conquest. I, uh, my, they, my, my great grandfather did all of this service to the crown. Therefore, I deserve to be, to be yep. appointed in, in, in the government, you know? So, I love that. And you know what else I love? I love how easy he says. And when you get back to the 1600s. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if we can barely, I've got a line I can't crack to get into the 1700s. And he's like, and when you get back to the 1600s. Yeah. We well, all- I, I, I also have some of those. It's, it's, it's not, not everything is. Not everything is so easy. There are places where it's very, very <laughs> difficult. I'm stocking some of them in the in the in the 1800s, but uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, we m most of the times we're just spoiled with the records that we have. That's it's just wonderful. amazing. It is. It is. Well, we have so appreciated talking to you. You take very much time live from Mexico. This is so. Isn't isn't the world great with yes. <laughs> technology today that we can we can do this kind of thing and and talk to you. So we appreciate it so, so much. And uh, um, yeah, with that, we'd like to say goodbye to everybody and we will see you next time on Gen Friends. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.